he's he's not here um he left me let me see if it is no i'm like literally in the same exact yes i'm literally the same everything i'm gonna go into settings video settings original ratio how's that there we go it was, you know what? I know he had done a different Zoom and I know they had him go into settings. That's why I. Good evening and welcome to Chicago Tonight. I'm Brandis Friedman here in our Northwest Side studio. And I'm Paris Schutz reporting live from Marquette Park in the broader Chicago Lawn neighborhood on the city's southwest side. On the show tonight, the changes you might see on your next trip to the hair salon. Why a merger of Southside hospitals isn't going as planned. A local artist teams up with designers to produce face masks. A Chicago casino, just one of the winners in Springfield. And details behind the historic liftoff that was rescheduled for Saturday. But first, Brandis, as we mentioned, I'm co-anchoring tonight from Chicago Lawn on the city's southwest side. More specifically, we're in Marquette Park. Now, this zip code has the third highest amount of positive COVID-19 cases in the entire state. So we will talk to local officials and residents about why exactly that is and what is being done about it. But first, Brandis, we go back to you for the latest developments from tonight. Paris, thank you. As the state moves closer to a partial reopening, Illinois passed another grim milestone today, topping more than 5,000 deaths related to COVID-19. These are real people whose lives came to an end because of this pandemic. They are grandparents and uncles and aunts and parents, cousins, children, friends. They had whole lives that were cut short because COVID-19 knows no boundaries and only seeks to destroy. We can never forget that. Today, state health officials announced an additional 160 deaths since yesterday. In addition, more than 1,100 people have tested positive since yesterday. This brings the total number of cases in Illinois to more than 114,000. And the Cook County Medical Examiner has also reached a sad milestone, handling more cases this year alone than in all of 2019. This team does not get the benefit of witnessing many success stories. Those who've survived the virus and will go on to lead productive lives surrounded by their loved ones. They see the worst of the outcomes of COVID-19. Last year, the ME determined cause and manner of death in almost 6,300 cases. Since January this year, it's handled more than 6,600, 3,700 of them from COVID-19. And the ME says even before the pandemic, her office noticed a dramatic increase in caseload. Much of it was caused by opioid overdose. And despite being away from their schools and teachers, Chicago Public School students are engaging in remote learning. The district released data today showing that more than three out of four students are participating. Since remote learning began about a month ago, participation has risen from 70% in the first week to 77% the week of May 11th. But rates of engagement are still lower than the district average for special needs students, English language learners, and homeless students. Chief Education Officer Latanya McDay told board members in a virtual meeting today how teachers are adapting during the pandemic. Our remote learning plans continue to involve 
evolve as we work to meet the needs of every child, including those students with diverse learning needs and those who have limited access to technology. And there's more of this story on our website. And tomorrow night, join us with school CEO Janice Jackson. She will be here on the program as well. It was the site of an infamous 1966 race riot where Dr. Martin Luther King was struck by a rock from an angry mob. Today, the Marquette Park neighborhood and the rest of the Chicago lawn community on the city's southwest side are staring down one of the worst COVID-19 outbreaks in Chicago. Parish Schutz spent the day reporting around the community near the 63rd Street Commercial Corridor, and he joins us now from Marquette Park, a giant public space, space with a lagoon and quite a history, Paris. It is quite a history, Brandis, and it's documented by this memorial right behind me to Martin Luther King. It documents when he came to Chicago in 1966 to protest discriminatory housing practices against African Americans. And as you mentioned, he marched to this park. He was met with a violent mob and struck with a stone in his head. It prompted him to call the protesters here the most violent he'd ever seen, more violent than anything he'd seen in the South. Now. The neighborhood in the ensuing decades has changed a lot. We're talking about Chicago lawn. It is about evenly split between African American and Hispanic, and it is working class. It has lower median income than other neighborhoods in Chicago, and it has been hit disproportionately hard with COVID-19, reporting 2,836 positive cases. That's the third highest outbreak in the entire state. And the nearby Mount Sinai Holy Cross Community Hospital has treated hundreds of COVID-19 patients. They say a challenge in the community has been convincing members of a very large undocumented immigrant population to come out and to get tested and get treated if they have symptoms. There is a fear in the community of coming out um, and, and being treated and we want to encourage everyone in the community broader um, to come out and, you know, seek care. Um, Sinai Health System is a, a safe place to do that. We have interpreters, we have uh, many services uh, for all of our patients, and so we want to invite people to come out to see their physicians and to feel like Sinai Health System is a safe place to do that. And as health concerns mount, so too do financial concerns. The Southwest Organizing Project, a local group here, warns of a ticking time bomb in this neighborhood. They estimate that perhaps more than half of residents here will not be able to afford their next month's rent. It's a trickle effect, right? You have jobs and then you are an essential worker, but your hours are less and less. And the longer you are with, without opening business up, like restaurants or food industry, then you have families that the only provider is working half of the time that he used to. And then on top of that, you have people with COVID, so more expenses on medicine. So yeah, making the rent is really more difficult now. Add to that the concerns of small businesses that have struggled to gain traction right now. The partial reopening might not really help this neighborhood, especially with restaurants because it's hard to imagine outdoor dining along some of the sidewalks on 63rd Street. That's the main commercial corridor. There's not a lot of room there. It's also hard to imagine shutting down that street, a very busy thoroughfare. Now, the Greater Southwest Development Corporation says the shutdown has put a halt to some limited progress that the community was making after being devastated in the 2008 housing crisis. Over the past few years, we started having some successes and we celebrated those successes, but there were hard fought wins and we started seeing little by little the commercial corridors improving. We're really worried that this uh, COVID crisis is we're going to regress and all the progress that we made, we're going to make backward steps. So we're really worried about that. Now, Garifuna Fleva is a restaurant here famous for its Belizean and Caribbean cuisine. It has had to adapt by getting some of that federal stimulus money, getting uh, GoFundMe fundraising to stay in business. But owner Hussein Castillo says the key to surviving right now is doing all delivery and takeout orders in-house as opposed to using one of those food apps. He says the costs of those food apps are onerous on his business. We have a team that, that does the deliveries and it definitely you know, gives a more personal experience as well. And, uh, you know, you, you run into issues with those apps sometimes where, you know, sometimes the driver will take the food and not show up. 
and th things like that would happen. So we just wanted to keep it as much in-house as possible. And we'll be back in just a bit from Marquette Park with a group that has dealt with all aspects of COVID-19, including testing. And now, Brandis, we toss it back to you. Yeah, Paris, those food apps, they've taken a lot of heat for the, the cost that they are charging to the restaurants. We'll see you in a bit. And now to Carol Marine and an in industry that's so far been cut from reopening in Chicago. Carol. Brandis, Illinois is now in its 10th week of the stay at home order and while it may not be a number one priority for everybody many of us could use a trip to the hair salon or to the barber shop as of this friday all salons and barber shops in the state except those in chicago will be allowed to reopen mayor lightfoot has said those in chicago will be able to reopen in early june but no firm date has been announced to the frustration of many salon owners. So when they do open, just what will the new salon experience be like and how many salons and barber shops are going to survive? Joining us to share some of their thoughts are Maggie Bujak, owner of Polorum Salon and Spa in Niles. She formed the I Cut Face Group that now has more than 3,600 members and has been lobbying lawmakers about guidelines for salons to reopen. Frank Falco is the CEO of Cosmetologist Chicago, which represents more than 18,000 salon professionals and runs America's Beauty Show, an annual showcase for industry professionals. Spring Capers is a stylist and owner of Springs Place Salon in the South Loop. And Larry Roberts, owner of Larry's Barber Shop and Larry's Barber College, which operates eight barber schools, including a free school in Cook County Jail and two in the Illinois Department of Juvenile Justice. Welcome all of you to Chicago tonight. Thank you, Carol. Thank you for Thank having you. us. Thank you. So Frank, let me start with you because we're always looking sure. for the breaking news of the moment. Any communications in the last couple of hours from the mayor's office on when exactly you think Chicago salons are going to open? You know, Carol, uh, the mayor's been consistent in saying that it's early June and uh, targeting the single digits, but nothing uh, different from the direction that she's given so far. And uh, as a salon community, you know, we support the mayor uh, because we want to open up safely, but we want to get open when we okay. need to. Any sense how many salons, Frank, across the state are not going to be able financially to open up, that'll be out of business by the time of a reopening? Carol, I, I, won't, I can't give you an exact number, but I can tell you that the community has been severely stressed over this uh, COVID-19 pandemic, like many small businesses. But ours in particular, um, you know, these are entrepreneurs. A lot of these are uh, single income providers. And, you know, being closed, the amount of time that we have so far has really put a lot of pressure on a lot of folks. So we're hoping for the best that people can survive and you know, as history has shown, Carol, uh, the beauty industry is, is a very resilient industry. So we're hopeful, but the, it is going to be a challenge. Maggie, you're in Niles, which is just over the border from Chicago. You'll open on Friday, a mile away inside the city. They can't reopen. What are beauty professionals saying about dealing with that dichotomy? You know, we, at, at this point in time, with everything that our industry has gone through, there's no such thing about as competition between salons. I've actually come together with local salon owners who are, during normal times, our biggest competitors. And we've been helping each other and we've been talking to each other. So we just, we feel horrible for these salons. We've already been getting calls from people who normally go to Chicago, but just can't wait to get in. And, you know, I mean, it's... It's unfortunate because I feel for those stylists. They've been waiting just as long as we have. Unfortunately, I, it's, it's just very detrimental to the industry that they are not sticking with the same guidelines as the state. So Spring, you're on the other side of this divide. You're on the, on the Chicago side of the border. Give me a sense of what your people are telling you about what's going on and how they're coping. Well, I have um, reached out over the last 10 weeks. I held a Zoom call every week with my clients to keep up with them, to do hair care packages, to do consultation. So that has kept 
us connected in the community and kept and helped them with their hair care needs during this time. So that has helped us a lot. We understand that the city is a lot denser than the suburbs. So it's important that we get it right, you know? So I understand uh, what the mayor has to deal with and it is a challenge, but I try to keep my, keep hope for my clients because we do more than hair care. And so make it important about their health and that their hair will be fine. Larry, are you confident that this will be a safe experience when you finally do open up the barbershops? Well, um, for me, Ben, I'm licensed in over 22 states with my master license. So by me owning cosmetology and barber schools, I think this is a great opportunity for us as stylists and barbers to go back to the basics. We, we've learned about infection control, sanitation, disinfection. We learned about coronavirus and HIV and all the bacteria and things that go on. So I think that's just a great opportunity for us to go back to what we know. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's really kind of almost impossible to do social distancing in a barbershop, in a salon. But what is, what is important is, is that we go back to what we know as it relates to being disinfecting, making sure that we're properly sanitizing um, and, you know, infections control. So I believe that this is a great opportunity for us just to kind of re-educate people and educate the people who come in. And those of us who are licensed, I think that this is a great advantage for us versus those who aren't licensed because now people are going to come in and they're going to want to patronize somebody who's theoretically sound enough to be able to, you know, make them knowledgeable on what's going on. Right. So, Frank, in terms of guidelines that have been issued by the city and, and by the state, are they clear? Are they consistent? Are they coherent? Yes, they are. They are clear and they are co consistent. Uh, you know, they've asked for our feedback. And I can tell you this, Karen, the, the number one barrier that's most important for everybody to manage is the mask. And that's we're asking our salons, uh, uh, professionals, we're asking our clients to basically, you know, wear a mask. And if we can all manage that one barrier, it makes it safer for everyone. Are and, you encountering um, any so, resistance? Are any of you encountering resistance about masks inside the salons? No. no. I have had some feedback in the iCut group of stylists who have said that they have clients that are telling them they will not be wearing a mask or Another fear that people are experiencing is that people are going to say they have a medical medical condition and feel that they don't need to wear the mask. And this is making the stylists very nervous because we can't ask for proof of that. We have to basically just take people's word for it. And it is nerve wracking to be in the position to tell someone that you may not be able to service them if they do not comply with our guidelines. Well, you know, we are, we are on um, when people, when people come in, we are actually I'm going to take everybody's temperature, students, staff, faculty, and uh, and we're going to pass out masks to the clients. We're going to take their temperature and have them answer a questionnaire. Basically, you know, have you been out the country? You know, have you been suffering with certain things? And that's pretty much, I think, the most that we can do. You know, and it can be as honest as possible. But, you know, a man can't get a shave and his mustache line and beard trim with a mask on. You know, people can't get color and a, a relaxer and a shampoo you know, with a mask on. So, you know, I think that we have to try and find a happy medium somewhere. You know, and Carol, one, one, go ahead. I'm sorry, Carol, one of the points that Larry brought up is that we are licensed beauty professionals. And in Illinois, cosmetologists have to undergo over 1,500 hours of training. And sanitation is critical to the licensure in Illinois. So our license matters. And it's something that we've invested in and we're very proud of to be licensed cosmetologists. That's true. The, how, how big a hit have your people taken and has the state or has the federal government stepped in to provide either loans or assistance or unemployment that's shoring them up? Has the, have there been enough cases of some help coming from the feds and, and the state? Spring? Um, so Spring, I'm, I, sorry. I'm sorry. I was lucky to get the uh, payroll protection program. I had a good relationship with my bank and I got in very, very early. Bec uh, so I was able to get, secure my uh, stylist their income for eight weeks. So that has been a tremendous help. And I also was able to uh, pay my utilities and defer my mortgage. 
So the bulk of my expenses were covered one, through that program. One quick so question. So that has been very good. Mm -hmm. Good. One quick question to all of you, and it's a really quick question because we're just about at the end. Uh, how have the mayor and the governor done in your view? Maggie? I think we had um, an opportunity to have more time to prepare, and that's something that I think a lot of people are very frustrated by. We just received our guidelines on Sunday, and now everybody is scrambling to call hundreds of clients to reschedule them to find the correct sanitizers and PPE. Yes, a lot of this is things we already have and do, sure. but we had two months of downtime to prepare. So I personally believe that um, the process could have been a little more efficient than it was. Frank, how's the mayor done? How's the governor done? Uh, I think they've reached out to us. The governor definitely has reached out to us. The task force uh, engaged us. The mayor, we uh, we just sent a note to recently. Uh, but definitely the, the state has tried to work with us and has helped get our input on establishing these guidelines. Spring, what's your judgment? Mayor, governor, how have they done? I think they've done a great job. It's a, it's a hard job to do, to save lives. So given that they uh, rolled it out in a thoughtful process, I am appreciative because lives are, have been saved. Okay. So Larry, that's the what, most important thing. Larry, what, you're the last word. How have they done? Hey, I was just with the governor and him and I had a great conversation and I feel like the mayor and the governor, what they did was they, they gave us an opportunity to further educate ourselves and make people more appreciative of our industry and realize that we are an essential. <laughs> well, good luck to all of you on this reopening whenever it occurs in Chicago. We know it will happen on Friday. Thanks very much for joining us. Frank Falco, Maggie Thank Bujak, you. Spring Thank Capers, you. and Larry Thank Roberts. Thanks. Thanks for Thank having you. us. Thank you. Thank you for Thank having you, everyone. Up next, we check back with Paris Schutz in Marquette Park, but first, Look at the weather. A quartet of Southside Hospital leaders are dropping a planned joint medical system after the state failed to come through with funding. Amanda Venicky joins us now to tell us what happened and what it means for Southside residents. Amanda. Brandis, the plan had been in the works since January. Four Chicago hospitals would come together, merge, and form one joint healthcare system. Advocate Trinity, St. Bernard's, Mercy, and South Shore hospitals. As a joint venture, hospital leaders said that they could better serve Southside residents. Instead, they ended up this week issuing a joint letter. We have determined that we see no path forward for our project, it reads. Now, the reason? a lack of money from the state. The hospital leaders had been depending on a billion dollars a year for the next decade. Legislators did talk about this project as part of broader hospital discussions. And during last week's abbreviated special legislative session, they passed a measure that is going to bring billions of dollars in part from the federal money to Illinois safety net hospitals. But they were unable to come with an agreement on how a related program would work that would give struggling hospitals money to transform, to rehab, to upgrade. One of the legislators who was reticent to get on board with that program was State Representative Marcus Evans. He lives in Avalon Park on the Chicago's south side. It's not that he's against the program. Evans says that he just didn't have all of the information he needed to vote on it. And dealing in hospitals and life-saving things, uh, this should be total clarity. Everybody should clearly understand uh, that the intentionality is going to match the results and yield something great for the community. I think that st will still happen, but there was some confusion around that. And uh, so it's a lot of folks advocated for, for more clarity. And again, we had COVID. This is a crazy time, not your normal session. Now, Evans is a cancer survivor. He says he knows firsthand the importance of having a quality healthcare system and one that's nearby. What I would visualize for my community would be uh, you know, ad major additions to existing hospitals, maybe a brand new hospital, uh, because hospitals not only bring healthcare, but they bring economic development. They bring uh, just aesthetics to a community. If you have a stroke, or like me, if you had some type of medical emergency, 
five minutes or 15 minutes can, will determine your life. So living within the close proximity to a hospital, uh, data shows that you have a more likelihood to survive. Again, Evan says it, the problem was that he wasn't going to vote for a hospital transformation program without greater guarantees about exactly how the money would be used. Critics, though, say that last minute parochial politics were at play, and they say that by stalling on funding for this project and others, important things like this Southside Hospital merger could be doomed permanently. Amanda, tell us more about what the planned hospital merger would have looked like and what does it mean now that those plans are dropped? Well, the plans called for building one new large hospital on the south side. Then there would be a handful of urgent and community care centers. Now, not everybody that I spoke with appreciates this plan. At least one community activist said that COVID-19 shows why you need both hospitals and community health care centers to do pre preventative care. He says residents of Lincoln Park don't have to choose between the two, so why should Southsiders? Now, it is unclear, however, what the future of this project is going to be. The status quo, these hospital leaders wrote in their letter, could perpetuate dangerous conditions that claim the lives of African Americans or it could further jeopardize residents' care. We believe this action will force hospital closures, cause further service cuts, and push access to care even further out of reach for the families we serve, the letter says. Now, I did speak with the CEO of South Shore Hospital, Tim Caveney. He says he doesn't know if the future is going to be a merger maybe with new partners and if that could be possible if the legislature does appropriate money for hospital transformation when it comes back to Springfield in the fall. When he was asked about it today, Governor J.B. Pritzker said one of the issues was just that with COVID-19 and revenues falling, money is just too tight. The legislature did, though, set aside $150 million a year to be used on projects like this for transforming hospitals into more modern facilities, better equipped for communities. But before any of that can be spent, they need to spell out exactly how that program will work, what projects will be eligible for the money. Again, advocates say, though, there is no time to wait for the fall, particularly given that the coronavirus has been killing African Americans in Chicago at alarmingly disproportionate rates. Back to you. Amanda, thank you. And still to come on Chicago Tonight. I never thought that the best thing I could do for people is stay away from them. A local artist reflects on the pandemic and looks for ways to help. Why your credit score is critical during a financial crisis. Our Spotlight Politics team reports on what passed and failed during the legislative session, the latest on reopening plans and more. And three, two, one, liftoff postponed. Details behind today's historic launch scrub. But first, we check back in with Paris Schutz, who's co-anchoring tonight from Marquette Park in the Chicago Lawn community on the city's southwest side. Hey, Paris. Hey, Brandis. Yeah, and I'm joined now with Rami Nashashibi, who is the executive director of Iman, and that is the Inner City Muslim Action Network, which runs a wide variety of programs here in Chicago Lawn and across the south side. Welcome back to Chicago tonight. Good to see you again. Thanks. So we mentioned that uh, this community is reporting the third highest amount of COVID-19 cases. What is your biggest concern as it relates to Chicago Lawn and Marquette Park? You know that not only uh, the high number of COVID-19 uh, cases, but even as we increase the testing, that we will continue to see uh, a, a disproportionate number of folks who are testing positive. That compounded with unemployment, compounded with kind of summer months that also uh, have historically you know, these kind of uh, periods of violence and the lack of real kind of comprehensive opportunities for housing uh, that create a real challenge for a lot of us who are on the ground. And, and let's break that down a little bit. So first with the testing, your organization is long term systematic kind of intervention. What, what would those look like? I, I think part of it is, you know, really creating not no, not only more affordable housing opportunities, but really kind of pathways to jobs more uh, systematic, you know, forms of holistic intervention that uh, get beyond some of the immediate anxieties and concerns. A lot of organizations like ours have been doing the rapid response, which is critical and which is important. 
but we need to also use this moment to get at what Martin Luther King was saying in spaces like this are the triple barriers for ghettos like the neighborhoods that he was confronting in the 60s when he came to Chicago. Poverty, race, and human misery, as he called it. And those solutions have to be much more systematic and much more bold and, you know, have to be on the level of Marshall Plan level interventions. We have to really pour significant economic development into neighborhoods that have historically not had that to create more meaningful opportunities. And part of what you do to create uh, opportunities is train ex-offenders when they come out for jobs, give them job skills. How difficult is that now, given that unemployment in general is so high? Well, you know, the unemployment rate has already been skyrocketing or in, in many of the neighborhoods that we've been working in, you know, 20, 30 percent unemployment rates. And of course, now we're all bracing for the consequences of COVID-19. Again, we're, we are all bracing for the short term pain, hoping that we can build up enough infrastructure to have some time of long term relief. And the relief is going to come when we, uh, we actually give the type of returning citizens, the populations that we're working with, young 18 to 25 year olds, the skill sets to succeed in industries that still have a fighting chance. I mean, we still, even uh, in this post COVID-19 moment, we're hoping and we're all praying for a type of economic rebound that will still allow us to see development and construction projects go on. We're still, uh, there are areas for employment in this economy, but we have to be very aggressive and we have to demand that the populations that typically are left out get an opportunity. All right, Rami Nashashibi, Executive Director of Iman, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Best of luck and stay healthy. Thank you. And Brannis will be back with some spotlight politics in just a bit. Yeah, Paris, impressive work Iman is doing out there. Thank you. Up next, tips to managing your credit score amid the pandemic. Don't ever miss Chicago Tonight. Subscribe to our podcast. Get a daily download of our show delivered to your desktop or mobile device. Go to WTTW.com slash Chicago Tonight podcast and subscribe. For the one in six Americans who have lost their jobs due to the coronavirus pandemic, their credit score might be the last thing on their minds. But our next guest wants people to know that amid the whirl of financial worries that come with losing income, protecting your credit score can help ensure continued access to money during periods of reduced income and in recovery. Joining us with more is Amanda Carney, co-founder and president of the Chicago-based nonprofit Credit Building Advisors Working Credit. Amanda, welcome back to Chicago Tonight. Thank you. Glad to be here. So first, why should people be concerned with their credit score during a crisis like this one? Well, you know, it's interesting because people are getting a lot of conflicting information out there. Um, people, you hear people talking about, don't worry about your credit now. You can just deal with that later once we get through the crisis. But here's the thing, you know, your credit score is really important. Um, in normal times, it it means uh, that you could pay, pay less for things like car loans and car insurance and credit cards and qualify for a mortgage. So really important things. Um, but in a time of crisis, because we're not in normal times, it means that you, if you have good credit, you may be able to access um, additional affordable credit. You can get a, a credit card if you need it. You can get a loan. So it's going to help you uh, weather this storm. And then once we move into recovery, what it means is people with good credit are going to have more options and at lower rates for addressing um, you know, the debt that they may have incurred uh, in order to weather this crisis. So credit really remains vitally important. So let's say you're maybe one of the people who has, you know, had income reduced or have lost it, unfortunately. Um, you've got rent, utilities, car loans, mm -hmm. credit card bills. What do you pay first? Right. And, and we're hearing this all the time. You know, we set up a, a free helpline to, to answer people's questions. And this is probably the number one question. So here's the thing. And, and this is what we're really emphasizing to people is that this crisis is very different from the 2008, the Great Recession. And the reason why is that this time creditors are very anxious to work with you in terms of working out payment um, uh, payment. Um, arrangements. And so, the, you know, the number one thing that we are emphasizing is that you need to talk to your creditors. They're going to help you come up with a hardship plan. But specifically, um, what we say, and particularly to protect your credit, the first thing you need to focus on is paying your credit cards 
and at any mainstream loans. And here's why. Those are the bills that report to the credit bureaus. If you are 30 days late on a credit card or a mainstream loan, that's a delinquency. It's going to lower your credit score by 100 to 125 points, and it's going to stay on your credit report for seven years. So we want to avoid that. So you know that's the first thing is um, is pay your credit cards, pay your mainstream loans. It only has to be the minimum balance for the credit cards. Next, if you can't make those payments, and we know that there are people now who cannot make those payments, you know, call the credit card company, call your loan servicer, ask them for a hardship plan. And then next, then focus on your other bills, your utilities, your landlords, your car loan, your car insurance. Tell them that you're in a hardship and, and see what solutions they may be willing Amanda, to you offer. Know for some folks, you know, calling the very people to whom you owe money can be a scary right. prospect. What is your advice for that? So, you know, again, I would emphasize that they want to work with you now. And um, if people need help in terms of how to think through this and how to talk to a creditor, please call us at our helpline. Um, but the main thing you want to do is explain that you are in a hardship. And then you want to be very honest with them about what you will, what you believe you will be able to afford to pay back and on what terms so that they can come up with um, a hardship plan that will work for you and for them. Is it advisable to use credit cards to cover expenses right now um, if, for example, your income has disappeared? We do, you know, we support people using credit cards and, you know, often they're the quickest, the safest um, and the most affordable way to deal with an emergency. Because if, if you think about it, you know, the average credit card that we see is, uh, has an interest rate of about 19%. And if you compare that to a payday loan, which with, when you combine interest and fees, it's 400%. So we do focus on and encourage people to use credit cards, but here are the things to remember. Don't push your credit card um, bills to the side. Make sure you pay them at least the minimum payment. If you can't make that minimum payment, call the credit card servicer and try to work out an alternate arrangement. And then the other things that we suggest are trying to spread your credit card debt over multiple cards because that's going to have less of an impact on your credit score. And then the final thing is if you are increasing your credit card debt during this crisis, your credit score may go down. But as soon as we come out of this crisis and you can start to reduce that credit card balance, your score is going to bounce right up generally by about 40 to 50 points. Okay. Um, and on our website, of course, you can find working credits guidelines on managing your credit during the pandemic. And Amanda Carney, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. For acclaimed artist and urban planner Theaster Gates, the coronavirus pandemic has given him a chance to withdraw to his Southside studio to create new works, but it has also compelled him to act. Known for a body of work that addresses social issues, Gates has now teamed up with fashion designers to produce thousands of protective masks for those who need them most. As part of our WTTW digital series, First Hand Coronavirus, here's Gates' story. To have an idea in your mind when you have no control over anything else, just being able to touch material and think of something and try to make it. And that is a real, it's a real pleasure. When it became evident that this virus was going to have a significant impact, it meant that I would have to shift significantly how I work. And I knew that I wanted to spend a portion of that time being selfish and enjoying the isolation in a way. My studio is a second home. It has all of the things that excite my imagination. But the other part felt like I would have to also maybe try to f figure out how I could be of service. And, I, and the service part was a little bit more complicated. A big part of my artistic practice is using abandoned buildings to create cultural spaces on the south side primarily. I have a space called the Stony Island Arts Bank. We've had to close it. I never thought that the best thing I could do for people is stay away from them. It's such a strange notion. There are moments when I feel like I'm not exactly sure what I can contribute. 
I don't feel like an artist whose practice could lift the heavy veil of this moment. I don't feel like an activist. I really want to feel like a neighbor, that in this moment, it feels like it's everyone's duty to be kind, to be generous. In the moment when I didn't know what to do, I would call my friend Jared Friedman, who happened to be the creative director of this company, Citizens of Humanity. And he said, hey man, we're gonna stop making jeans and we're gonna make these masks. And I was like, I want in. And it felt like I could function as a kind of conduit from this fashion company that was willing to make masks to, to my city. They had so many cool materials around. Uh, they ended up making these out of a kind of camo motif. And uh, obviously it's the one that I like a lot. We will direct 1,000 masks to the Chicago Food Depository because it felt like those workers and those in need of a meal could both benefit pretty quickly. It's clear to me that it actually requires times of crisis for the everyday person to also recognize that they're extremely creative and resilient. They're actually not far from the uh, solutions. It's just that life has been so comfortable that we actually don't have to worry about solutions often. But I think in this case, more and more people will find themselves functioning as artists and creatives. When I think about what culture might look like at the end of this, I think it's gonna be less about market-driven things and more about creative people who want to get together in their living room or get together in the basement and spend time together. I think that I'm just gonna be able to be present more in Chicago and present with the people who I love. And I'm gonna to try to focus my resources, which are really space and a big smile. I'm gonna to try to focus those resources on the people who I care about and try to do as much as I can locally. And Theaster's story is part of a series of first-hand accounts from Chicagoans coping with the public health crisis. You can watch the series at uh, wttw.com slash firsthand. Chicago scores a casino win in the legislative session that just wrapped up, and both the governor and Mayor Lori Lightfoot expand on what reopening will look like. So joining us with all that and more are our very own Spotlight Politics team of Amanda Venicky, Heather Sharon, Carol Marine, and Paris Schutz. Hello, everyone. Hello. Hey, Hello. Paris. So, Amanda, let's start with you. We got some word uh, this afternoon that a General Assembly worker had tested positive for COVID-19. What do we know? We don't know a ton, but what we do know, I think, is comforting or should be, hopefully, to any legislators or staff. This was actually somebody who apparently worked for the convention center. I'm told after a little bit of digging, it appears to have been somebody who worked for security, worked one eight-hour shift on Thursday, and didn't actually interact much with legislators or with legislative staff. Nonetheless, all members of the General Assembly, reporters as well, who were at the convention center, are being asked to self-isolate for 14 days. That is also the guidance that they had going into that abbreviated special session. Okay, and Amanda, we also know state lawmakers gave Mayor Lori Lightfoot uh, a big win with this uh, casino during this legislative session. What changed? Huge win. I think what changed is partially her lobbying tactics. Uh, it, she did group in. It was meant to be just Chicago so that it didn't become too overweighted with everybody else wanting a little bit of ask every time you get into something as controversial like gambling. Legislators from all pockets of the state say, hey, wait, what about me? I want in too. It was narrow and yet did appeal some to downstaters and that it also did a bit of a favor helping out Danville. And I think also in the coronavirus time when there's widespread recognition of the dire straits that Illinois is going to be in financially, there was widespread recognition that we're going to need some money. Legislators are going to want the capital and construction projects that the casino is supposed to be funding. And they knew that it couldn't happen if not for this. So all of that, I, I think, contributed. Carol, Mayors Daly and Emanuel could not make this happen. What does this say to you? It says, uh, Brandis, that if you sit in front of a slot machine, 
long enough and hit it enough times, eventually you're going to hit a jackpot. I think that this took some time, it took some effort, it took the compromise of what the casino operators were going to uh, extract in terms of a reduced amount of, of taxes. And it took, as Amanda says, the enormous imperative that we are out of money in dire straits, have pension fund problems with police and fire and infrastructure needs. And so it all conspired to happen. Paris, what will a casino look like in Chicago? May not be on the water, and, and what are some of the next steps? Well, according to Mayor Lightfoot, it's going to be part of a broader entertainment complex. It'll probably be a little classier than your average run-of-the-mill casino, maybe family-friendly. We don't know where it's going to go. Now, remember, Mayor Lightfoot had the gaming board put together that commission to study feasible sites, and they all looked at places in the neighborhoods on the south and west sides, and they said none of them are feasible. And aldermen in those neighborhoods don't necessarily want a casino there anyway, so the conclusion is it's going to have to be somewhere close to tourism, somewhere close to downtown, but in a spot that folks from the neighborhoods could get jobs there and travel to jobs there. You know, a spot that was talked about was Michael Reese, but that seems to be off the table right now. But that seems to be the kind of spot that would work for a casino. And the next steps are to put together a commission to do just that, to talk about where it's going to go and, and to get community buy-in. And all that said, knowing how commissions typically work, when could this happen? Oh, Brandis, <laughs> if I were a betting person, I wouldn't put a... I wouldn't put a dime on uh, on the over under on when this could happen. It could be many years. You would not bet I mean, on that. I one. don't want to say many years. Let's let's say a couple years. I see, I see what you did there, um, Heather. A bill okay. to waive rent and mortgage payments failed in Springfield, but there's still a little bit of good news for renters, right? That's right. The General Assembly agreed to take about $400 million in federal relief funds and earmark those for both landlords and tenants who haven't been able to pay their bills because of the coronavirus pandemic. And in the coming month, they'll be able to apply for those funds that will hopefully tide them over as we seem to now be coming off the peak, as Governor J.B. Pritzker said this week. So um, there's a little bit of hope there, but rent is due for most people on Monday. And there are many people who have been out of work for a long time now with unemployment in Illinois hitting 16.4% last month, an all-time modern-day record. Yeah, for some folks, this means the third month uh, missing rent, if, if that's the case for them. Um, Carol, Mayor Lori Lightfoot, she calls her new police superintendent David Brown's anti-violence plan over the Memorial Day weekend a fail after 10 people were killed. This was his first real test in Chicago. Good way to start out. You know, it's not a surprising way to start out. Chicago has intractable violence problems. And though he has a stunning resume and, and great recommendations, the fact of the matter is that you are the new guy in town coming from a smaller police department to a city that is wracked with these problems. I think in some ways it did him a favor. It was a kind of cautionary moment. And if you looked at Lightfoot, she didn't say uh, the fail statement with anger. In fact, that made it worse. It was said kind of coldly and clearly. And, um, and it's a warning to everyone that she, is, she needs what she needs. She needs success here, and he's going to have to deliver it, and he's going to have to find a way, and he has not yet. Paris, how do you read sort of how the mayor delivered that statement as well as, you know, how the crime numbers shook out over this past weekend? Well, I think it's kind of problematic to put all your eggs in one basket and say it's all on the police department if the crime numbers are high in a specific week. You know, look at the conditions that we have. We have a shutdown. We have massive unemployment right now. We have people that have been cooped up. We have the warm weather coming. And, you know, the superintendent, David Brown, comes in and says he wants to get that number down under 300. Well, it's not going to be just policing that's going to do that. It's going to be economic development. It's going to be fixing, you know, structural inequities and poverty. And without those other things, I, I don't see how, how, the, how the police alone can drastically bring down the murder rate. So when you constantly put these expectations that, that the police are going to, you know, make sure that there aren't a lot of murders and then it doesn't happen, it, it, it seems to be problematic messaging to me.
Yeah, which is the same thing that we hear from a lot of uh, anti-violence community organizations as well, Paris. Um, now, the state in Chicago, we're inching closer to reopening on slightly different timetables. Uh, Paris, what's that going to look like? Uh, well, it's going to look different uh, in Chicago than it is going to be uh, in the suburbs. I mean, you had Carroll before. The big concern here is in neighborhoods like this, Chicago Lawn, how are restaurants going to do outdoor dining when you walk down the sidewalk on some of these commercial quarters? There's no room. I mean, it works downtown. It works on the north side. It works in Lincoln Park. But what, what's the solution here? Do they come out to this park and do it remotely? I mean, I think all those things have to be talked about. And on that note, you know, Heather, uh, you wrote a story today about uh, the possibility of closing streets for pedestrians and bikers in certain communities, certain streets. That's right. Um, so there are some proposals out there that the mayor is looking at. Some are in neighborhoods like Hyde Park, but more are on the north side where Logan Square and Wicker Park, they have those extra wide sidewalks and they have a lot of ca sidewalk cafes to begin with. So you can sort of spread out a little bit, but it's really unclear how precisely it will work and whether it will be enough to keep these restaurants in business because they will only be allowed uh, to uh, uh, be at 25% of their capacity. So if their capacity was 100 people, that's only 25%. And we all know that restaurants operate on really thin margins. And I think there's a great deal of concern that, that this isn't going to be enough even once it gets started sometime in mid or early to mid-June. And Heather, one more thing before we go. We've got about 30 seconds left. Uh, I know you're keeping an eye on this. The central region um, in the governor's uh, plan for reopening has slipped backwards, actually, with regards to hospital admissions. Any idea yet how that will affect the state's reopening plan as we move towards phase three? It's not clear. That was the first time that we had seen a downstate area sort of move backwards. So it's something that um, I imagine that the Illinois Department of Health will be watching very carefully. But the rate of coronavirus infections on the, in the central region is much lower, even with the increased hospitalizations. Um, and so it may be sort of uh, an anomaly that the governor's plan provides for so that it's not sort of a draconian whoops, now you're out. Um, but it is something that is worth watching, and it's important to remember that in central Illinois and in southern Illinois, there are very limited hospital capacity, which is one of the things the governor has been worried about, and, and if a surge happens. Okay. More to come on that, I'm sure. Uh, my thanks to Heather Sharon, Amanda Venicky, Carol Marine, and Paris Schutz. Thank you. Up next, the latest on the manned space launch, so stick around. Don't miss one of our stories. Get them all delivered to your desktop or mobile device with a subscription to the WTTW News Daily Briefing. Go to WTTW.com slash Daily Briefing and sign up. Amidst a pandemic, life carries on, including spaceship launches. But today, the Falcon 9 rocket did not lift off from the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. The launch is rescheduled for Saturday, and when it happens, it will be the first liftoff carrying astronauts from American soil in nine years. Joining us with more details is WTTW News reporter Patty Wetley. Patty, you know, what happened today? Why didn't the, the liftoff happen? It was a whole lot of buildup, that's for sure. Um, but in short, one word, weather. Um, they have a whole, you know, portion of the Air Force devoted to meteorology for these liftoffs, and they've got a whole bunch of reasons why they don't happen. And lightning, the threat of lightning is a big one, and today the weather was just kind of too stormy in Florida for this launch to happen. Yeah, there are reports about a uh, tornado warning in the area. Um, so yeah. the Falcon 9 rocket, it came from a collaboration between Elon Musk's uh, SpaceX firm and NASA, which is a pretty unique partnership. Tell us more about that and what makes this historic. Yeah, this is the first crewed flight um, as part of this new program that NASA has as a public-private partnership. So before all of the craft um, were, all of the technology was owned by NASA, the craft were owned by NASA. This time, NASA astronauts are going up in space, but Elon Musk, SpaceX, and Boeing is um, another one of the contractors on this. They own the technology. 
um, and they're creating just the means for NASA to get its folks to and from the space station, the International Space Station, and ultimately, you know, folks like you and I could hitch a ride um, on this. So this is kind of the first human test of whether somebody other than NASA can get folks into space. And we'll have to wait until the weekend to find out. Patty Wetley, thanks as always. Thanks, Brandis. And you can read Patty's full story on our website, where you'll also find how you can watch the Falcon 9 launch. That's at WTTW.com slash news. And that is our show for this Wednesday night. Don't forget to stay connected with us by signing up for our daily briefing. And you can get Chicago Tonight streamed on Facebook, YouTube, or our website, as I just mentioned, WTTW.com slash news. And you can get the show via podcast and the PBS video app. And please join us tomorrow night live at 7. That's right. Now, for all of us here at Chicago Tonight, I'm Brandis Friedman. And I'm Paris Schutz. Thank you so much for watching. Take care. Closed captioning for this program is brought to you by Robert A. Clifford and Clifford Law Offices, serving Chicago as a personal injury law firm since 1984.